the Thank floor you is all. yours. Thank you all, especially Liz. My presentation tonight is uh, directly and indirectly about ice. Uh, I wish we were standing looking at the Blue Glacier on Mount Olympus, but here we are on Zoom. In the lower left is a, just making sure that, you guys don't see the pictures on the left, do you? Is it just the main picture? I'm seeing pictures. Oh, here, here yeah. we go. Okay. There we go. So in the lower left is a snowflake, and if we compact them and melt them, pretty soon we have glacier ice which on the lower right picture, the boundaries between the ice crystals, which are centimeters across, are uh, shown by a mixture of red dye and alcohol. There are glaciated places in the Ukraine. And I today submitted a picture to the Ice Age Floods Institute of one such place. Uh, for your weekly picture. And I'm sure that we're all very concerned about what's going on in the Ukraine. So I wanna dedicate this talk to them. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna to spend roughly a third of the time on glaciers, a third of the time on permafrost and a third of the time on climate change. So let's get with it. First of all, one of my pet peeves is that most people including many geologists, use the terms glaciation. That's okay. I'm, I'm Gary, I'm, I'm on. Gary Federoff is watching this. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody's speakers for now um, so that we can all hear, hear Bob. All right. Bob, can you share your screen again? Sure. All right. Sorry I about that. So. I hope so. All right, I, I definitely see your screen. That's good. Woo. All okay, both terms glaciation and ice age are most often used as a time period. Uh, ice ages are long and include glaciations and interglaciations, whereas glaciations are short. And I will get into more detail on that in a few minutes. Within each ice age, we have currently 100,000 year glacial interglacial cycles with a considerable difference between the two. The peak of the last glaciation was only 20,000 years ago. The Earth's land was 30% covered by ice. The ultimate source of that ice was the oceans. So sea level was down 125 meters and the mean temperature of the earth was approximately eight degrees Celsius. In between these glaciations, we had relatively short interglaciations. The peak of the most recent one was 5,000 years ago, and I'll get into that later. We have about 10% of the land area of the world covered with ice right now and sea level is at approximately its present value and has been that way for five or 6,000 years. The mean temperature of the earth is 14 degrees Celsius headed for 15. Now, for some reason or another, it's not advancing. Hmm, go. As I said, there are many, many glaciations within each ice age, and these are controlled by Earth-Sun geometry. 
so that in the picture at the bottom, which I'm going to show after a while again, we see high peaks, which could represent high temperatures, high sea level, lack of glaciers, uh, and low peaks, which represent uh, the peaks of glaciation lots of ice cover on the earth and colder temperatures. The earth-sun geometry factors called Milankovitch cycles uh, relate to three things. I'm not gonna try to explain the precession of the equinoxes unless somebody asks me that at the end. Uh, the tilt of the earth's axis uh, is, the earth's axis wobbles and varies by a few degrees. And we don't have a circular orbit, we have an elliptical orbit. Orbit. One of the things that's really important about these three Earth-Sun geometry factors is that they are close to multiples of each other. So if we just uh, look at the top graph for the precession of the equinoxes, we see that one of the cycles is 100,000 years. We see that the tilt of the Earth's axis is 41,000 years, which in very, very rough numbers is half of, of, an, of 100,000 years. And then we see that one of the cycles for the elliptical orbit is 100,000 years. So in other words, these can all reinforce each other. They mean that at times the Northern hemisphere, which is most important because it has most land, can get enough snow in the summer to reflect enough sunlight so that it persists until the next winter when more snow falls. And very gradually we get glaciers and they spread across the landscape, particularly in Scandinavia and North America. Let's go back for a minute to these ice ages. They are controlled more than anything else by plate tectonics. That is when we have enough landmass near either or both poles, we can get an ice age. The earth has only had five ice ages. They existed uh, between two and a half and two million years ago. They existed in the late Precambrian, let's say roughly uh, six or 700,000 years ago. They occurred in Ordovician and Silurian when Rhodes Fairbridge discovered glacial features in the Sahara Desert. It blew everybody's mind. Uh, we had a really significant uh, ice age and called the Promo Carboniferous Ice Age in which all the Southern continents were glaciated. That include India, which since then has moved up to join Asia. And then, of course, we've had the Ice Age for the last few million years. I now want to talk about the characteristics of glaciers, and I want to start out with glacier velocity. If the ice is either too thin or its surface slope is too gentle, the glacier doesn't flow. And so we refer that to as a stagnant glacier. Other glaciers, there are a couple of terms which sometimes confuse people. We have polar or cold-based glaciers, which have a mean annual temperature below freezing and which can only flow. They cannot slide because they are frozen to their bed. On the other hand, we have temperate glaciers, also called warm-based glaciers, which are at the freezing point. They're at roughly zero degrees Celsius. They can not only flow and flow faster because when ice at is a higher temperature, it is uh, uh, less viscous, but they can also slide on the layer of water that it's their bottom. So they flow, they move by flow and slip much faster than cold based glaciers. And then there is a particular type of temperate or warm based glacier, which we call a surging glacier. They can move at kilometers per year. Uh, the exact mechanism is not well known, but if a layer of meltwater base, uh, at the base of the glacier gets to approximately 10 centimeters thick, uh, then it makes it easy for the glacier to slide pretty quickly. Uh, let's look at pictures of these four different types of glaciers. Uh, typically a stagnant glacier has a lot of kettles on it. Uh, and ice masses, and very often, as we see here on the north side of Mount Everest, uh, a lot of debris on it. Uh, incidentally, I, unless the pictures have a name by them, I took them all. And if anybody want to ask, wants to ask any particular questions about them, 
uh, I'll be glad to do so at the end. This is at 7,500 feet on the north side of Mount Everest, 17,500 feet on the north side of Mount Everest. Okay, the glaciers in Antarctica are polar glaciers. Uh, some of their characteristics just from looking at them is they have very, very steep sides. And then here's my favorite temperate glacier on Mount Olympus. And uh, before we go further uh, to illustrate the fact that temperate glaciers can slide, I wanna show this picture by Austin Post. These are icebergs which have been calved in Alaska and notice where the two arrows are that they're lines on the bottom of the ice. As the ice drags rock across bedrock, it grooves and strikes the bedrock. At the same time, the irregularities on the bedrock make grooves on the base of the glacier. While my students and I were transverse, traversing Mount Kenya uh, 12 years ago, we happened to take a peek under the Lewis Glacier and we could see the grooves on the bottom of it. Again, they have been formed as the, as the ice slides across the bedrock. Surging glaciers are, are pretty awesome. Uh, there's a story of some people that set up camp in front of a surging glacier uh, at noon and said, well, let's go take a peek at this and we'll get serious about our research tomorrow. So they went up the glacier and checked, up its si checked out its sides and came back and their tents were about to be overrun by the ice. So they, they can really move fast. This is uh, where four glaciers have come together to, to form a single glacier. And we know that it's four glaciers because each one of these black lines is a medial moraine in between where two glaciers up valley have joined. So there were four glaciers here. And the fact that the medial moraines are curved, that means that at various times, a glacier from our right, a glacier left, has moved out and deformed the medial moraines or has come from the other side and deformed the medial moraines. So one of the characteristics of surging glaciers is these twisted medial moraines. Another characteristic is that they are extremely crevassed, uh, moving at as much as kilometers per year. They, they really break up. A uh, large percentage of the ice can come from the upper and middle parts of the glaciers so that often the medial moraine, the lateral moraines get abandoned and the lower part of the glacier goes kilometers away. Another uh, factor that we can talk about with in terms of glaciers is are they retreating or advancing or are their margins stationary? So accumulation is any way in which the glacier receives ice, mainly by snowfall, but it can be from avalanches, for example. Ablation is any way that it loses ice, which would be uh, by melting and so-called uh, sublimation and also by calving. If the accumulation is greater than the ablation, the glacier gets bigger, it gets thicker, its margin, its down valley margin advances. If accumulation is equal to ablation, the glacier is in equilibrium. It stays the same size, and that means that the material being deposited in the, at, the edge, at the lower edge of the glacier is accumulating, again, because the lower edge of the glacier is not moving up or down the valley. So then we can build a moraine, and every time we see a moraine on a valley floor, it tells us that when that moraine was being built, accumulation was equal to ablation. What's happening today is that accumulation for most glaciers is less than ablation. And this means the margin retreats because the glacier is getting smaller and thinner. It does not mean that the glacier is defying gravity. To say that a glacier is retreating does not mean the ice is moving up the hill. It means that the margin of the ice is moving up the hill. So here's one of my favorite glaciers. It's called the Greater Crater Glacier. Its accumulation began in 1980 during the great eruption of Mount St. Helens. It's there despite the fact of a hot steaming dome in the middle of it. It started in, about in the bottom of this picture and it moved around the uh, dome to the west and also to the east. These two glaciers merged. This particular glacier is advancing for multiple reasons. One of them being is that the caldera of Mount St. Helens is facing north, so it gets a lot of shade. Another reason is the steep caldera sides result in lots of avalanches 
adding to the accumulation of the, of the ice in the glacier. Here uh, in, in the Columbia ice fields, we see a prominent lateral moraine, which has been abandoned. The edge of the ice is right down here, and another one on the other side. When the ice extended from here all the way to here, which was probably during the Little Ice Age in roughly 1850 or so, uh, this glacier was in equilibrium and a lot of sediment was accumulating at its edges in these uh, lateral moraines. Glacier National Park is the place that people often worry about, perhaps because of its name. And the bottom line is in yellow down at the bottom of it. You can read that faster than I can talk. Uh, just one example here of many, what the Shepherd Glacier looked like 100 years ago and what it has looked like recently. It's really no longer a glacier, it's just snowfields. And a final way in which, which we can classify glaciers is by size and shape. Uh, this particular glacier sits atop Mount Kilimanjaro, and I chose it just to have an introduction to this part of my presentation. But one of the things you can see here is these annual layers, layers of snow and ice that accumulate at the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro. And you can also see these black layers of dirt uh, from the volcanics up on top of the mountain getting blown around and a certain amount of black carbon and dirt falling out of the skies, uh, making those dark layers. So anyhow, the smallest glaciers are called cert glaciers. They sit in armchair shaped uh, places on the sides of mountains. They probably started in a place where there was a slight depression on the side of the mountain. They accumulated enough snow to turn into a glacier. Then they start rotating. They start eroding at their base, dragging rocks across the bedrock uh, and make this bowl-shaped uh, depression that we call a cirque. This is the Teton Glacier between Mount Owen and the Grand Teton. This is Gunsight Notch for reference here and here. And the Teton Glacier uh, reached a maximum in the last 5,000 years or so, and roughly during the Little Ice Age in the 1800s, and it has since retreated back from there. If these uh, cirque glaciers, that's sort of one right there or up here, if they all get together and flow out of the cirque and join other cirque glaciers, then we get what's called a valley glacier. Uh, I'll show a couple of pictures of valleys. Uh, here we have Lake Chelan, uh, closer to where you all live than where I live, a most spectacular valley glacier coming out of the Cascades, made this lake. And the Cordier and Ice Sheet coming from the Okanagan Highlands actually pushed parts partway up the lake uh, after the Lake Chelan Valley Glacier was retreating. This is my favorite glacial valley right here for several reasons. It's on Chiripo, which is the highest peak in Costa Rica. And number one, it has a whole bunch of small lakes in the bottom of the glacial trough. Those are called Pater Noster lakes because they sort of look like the beads on a rosary. But what's most amazing in this whole place, it's the only place I can think of on earth that had this intense alpine glaciation, yet there have been no historic snowfalls. Even from as long ago as the Spaniards came and, and the Little Ice Age, et cetera, that's because when it happens to be colder than freezing up here, it's clear weather. If anybody knows any other place that has never had snow, but has had uh, glaciation, I'd like to hear about it. Okay, if the valley glaciers all get together and start to overwhelm the divides between them, as was the case in the Olympic Mountains about 20,000 years ago, then we have what's called a mountain ice cap a whole bunch of ice covering a single mountain range. If the glaciers from individual mountain ranges like the Canadian Rockies and the Canadian Coast Range and the North Cascades all get together and fill the space in the middle, then we call that a mountain ice sheet. Uh, just to the north of you, we have spectacular examples of 
uh, the edge of a mountain ice sheet. Here, this big Withrow moraine, and here's some uh, striations at uh, the town of Chelan. And of course, if it wasn't for this mountain ice sheet, you all would not exist. There wouldn't be an Ice Age Floods Institute. And you know all about that, so we'll, we'll keep going. If a glacier is even bigger and overwhelms a continent or even an island the size of Greenland, then we have what we call a continental ice sheet. There were two other continental ice sheets 20,000 years ago. One was the Scandinavian ice sheet and the other was the Laurentide ice sheet. That one over much of Northern Canada was joined to the Cordillera ice sheet on the west in Alberta and to the Greenland ice sheet on the east. I, I'm going to start to throw in uh, in my slides now some references to the literature. And you might notice that many of these are very recent. So for example, on the left, occasionally now it rains on top of the Greenland ice sheet, whereas it always used to be snow. Or the fact that the Thwaites Glacier, which is right here in unstable West Antarctica ice sheet, Antarctica actually has two ice sheets, an eastern stable one and a smaller western unstable one. Anyhow, if the Thwaites Glacier uh, goes out into the sea, uh, it could cause sea level to rise very suddenly by more than two feet. I want you to, uh, I'll come back to this later, but I'll remind, I wanna remind you that if icebergs or sea ice melt, it does not raise sea level. But if a glacier flows off the land into the sea, it does raise sea level. And that may destabilize glaciers or portions of glaciers further inland and cause more ice to flow out to sea. Here's another picture of the edge of the southwest edge of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, I there, there is a term called ELA, equilibrium line altitude, which you can think of as more or less as being the elevation of snow line. In southern Greenland in 2014, I'm sorry I don't have more recent data, the ELA was at 1,840 meters, and it is rising all the time. Above the ELA, there is net accumulation. There are going to be a lot of snow falling in the winter and some melting in the summer. Below the snow line or ELA, there's net ablation. Yes, there's snow that falls over all Greenland at some time or another every year, but there's more melting than there is accumulation. And this level is rising. So obviously, if it gets above the top of Greenland, then all of Greenland will start melting and that will cause its elevation to go down. And that will mean that Greenland will probably never ever get glaciated again, ever, because of global climate change. Okay, that's it for glaciation. We're gonna skip, how am I doing on time? I'll take a peek at my watch. Looks like I'm about five minutes behind. Okay, let's talk about frozen ground. First of all, I wanna differentiate between seasonal frost, which occurs in the Tri-Cities every winter. And in most places on earth, this freezing does not get deeper than about two meters and then it thaws in the spring. That's in contrast to permafrost, which is defined as ground with the temperature at or below freezing for two or more years. If it, if it only uh, stays frozen for one summer, that doesn't count. It has to be two years, just based on the definition. Also note that that is independent of moisture content. So permafrost can be pure ice or it can be completely dry rock or soil. What's really important about permafrost and the, and the landforms that it creates and for that matter, seasonal frost too, and the landforms that it might create is the number of freeze-thaw cycles. So how many years is this going on and how many freeze-thaw cycles are there during each year? The more we have, the more it can make in terms of landforms and the more hazards can originate. And one of the neat things, which is not important from an environmental or engineering viewpoint, but I'll show some pictures of it, is the pattern ground that can be created during freeze-thaw cycles. Here's some more uh, bottom line items about permafrost. It's in what we call a periglacial environment. 
it doesn't have enough moisture to have glaciers. The peri can mean almost in terms of climate, or in some cases, it means almost in terms of proximity. So the mean annual temperature has to be below zero, and it has to be dry. If, if there's more than about 15 inches of precipitation a year, we're going to get glaciers instead of permafrost. So permafrost underlies 15% of the Earth's land area. And if you add 10% of the land area occupied by glaciers, we get a grand total of 25% for tonight's presentation. OK, here's something I just learned about an hour ago. Thawing permafrost in the peaks of the Alps in Europe is causing more and more rockfall, which can be quite dangerous to the villages below. The upper layer of permafrost freezes every winter and thaws every summer. It can be as much as two meters thick. Beneath it is the permafrost proper, which here is relatively clear ice, but as I said, it could also be dry rock. If there is a winter in which the freezing does not go as deep, as the thawing had the previous summer, there can be a layer of water saturated ground in between the frozen active layer and the permafrost. That's called a talic. We can also get talics within permafrost because sometimes sediment is so fine, fine grained that there's so much capillary attraction by the water that by, by the uh, clay particles that it, it can't freeze. And then the unfrozen ground beneath permafrost is also called a talic. These are Eskimo words. This is a map of Alaska. Everywhere north of the Brooks Range, with the exception of big rivers like the Colville, is continuous permafrost everywhere. It may only be a meter thick or it can be a kilometer thick. South of that, in central Alaska, we have discontinuous permafrost, which is here and there. For the most part, on, on northern slopes, like the northern side of the Alaska range, there is permafrost, and most south-facing slopes do not have it. Then the third type of permafrost uh, in this geographic nomenclature is called sporadic, and it's only going to be at higher elevation. So that could be uh, Beartooth Pass in Wyoming. That could be the tops of the Alps in Europe, whatever. The important thing about permafrost is one of the important things about permafrost in terms of an engineering hazard is that when it freezes in the winter, it expands. Uh, just like water turning to ice always expands. And when it thaws in the summer, it contracts, but there's much more than that. So before I get into that, let me talk about the many processes associated with freeze thaw. In general, they're going to be more prominent where there's permafrost, but they also can occur in areas with seasonal frost. So I'm going to show, if you just read through these quickly, I'm going to show one or two pictures of each of these phenomena that is related to freeze thaw and permafrost. Many people had the idea that when permafrost forms, the only thing that happens is you get some expansion. But ice behaves like every other solid. As the temperature goes below zero degrees Celsius, it contracts. So this is a crack as the permafrost went down to maybe minus 40 degrees Celsius. Occasionally, when this contraction occurs, a root gets stretched. And then if you hit it with a rock hammer, it sounds like a bass drum. Anyhow, so bottom line, as the water freezes, it expands. But as the temperature gets colder, it contracts. Here's an example of frost chatter. I love this picture because it's, it's a, a felsic rock sitting on mafic rocks uh, up on the Europe's biggest glacier in Iceland. And this rock has just been disintegrated by freeze thaw. Uh, the term frost heave refers to shoving stuff up. 
And some of that might be frost push, that is un ice underneath a rock as, it, as the water turns the ice, it expands and pushes the rock up. But the other thing that can happen is that as the ice forms around the rock, it can grab it and pull it up. So I love these pictures. I've got dozens of them. I tried to restrict myself to two of these rocks that have been shoved up by frost heave. And then we have frost shove. And, and what's happened here is as this ground is, is uh, expanding, it makes these little ridges in between the ice wedges. So there, I'll show pictures of ice wedges after a bit, but there's ice wedges underneath each one of these places. And this is a place where the ice edges have not melted. We're going to see the opposite topography when we get to what's called thermokarst. So freezing and thawing can do a tremendous amount of sorting. So here is a picture of polygons. And notice that the polygons are boarded by, bounded by boulders, whereas in the center, there's enough fine grain sediment so that a little bit of vegetation is actually growing. In uh, periglacial geomorphology terminology, we separate the coarser material and call it stones and the finer grain material and call it fines. The, the stones will be pebbles, cobbles, and boulders. The fines will be clay, silt, and sand. So here's, here's another place where there's been sorting. And we're actually digging a trench here in Mongolia across uh, a polygon to see what is happening at depth. And basically, these rocks just keep going down. And the finer grain proportion in the middle just keeps going down. Here's another example uh, on the volcano Cotopaxi in Ecuador of a sorted circle as opposed to a sorted polygon, which we miss saw. And these, I believe, are the most spectacular sorted circles on Earth. They are in Svalbard, which is a group of islands halfway between Norway and the North Pole. And the largest of those islands is called Spitsberg. And I'm sure you've heard of one or the other. But Bernay, Bernard Halle at the University of Washington did a lot of research up there and it made the front cover of science. There are periglacial features, which probably were a result of permafrost and not just seasonal frost, where you all live. And my favorite and most spectacular ones are the stone ringed mounds, which are composed of silt, probably lust, and they're surrounded by a circle of rocks. And what's probably happened is that with every freeze thaw cycle, the rocks have moved up to the surface and have been ejected. Here, uh, as, uh, as with freeze thaw cycles. I think we lost that, your screen, Bob. When that comes up, I don't know why that keeps coming up. Hmm. There we go. Yeah, but now it's not advancing again. Hmm. Okay, there it goes. All right. Uh, stone stripes are widespread in the Yakima Hills, and they are probably creeping down the hill today. Uh, freeze thaw helps them, but there may, may be some processes like cell flexion, we'll explain in a few minutes, which also may be helping these stones move down the hill. It definitely results in some sorting. There are more stones here and only scattered stones there. Another phenomena that may or may not be related to freeze thaw, but I love to talk about is stone steps. And there, Kevin Pogue in my department and, and I disagree 100% on the origin of, of terra sets. The bottom line is, are they geologic and due to mass wasting or are they biologic and due to large mammals? So I'll leave that to you guys to argue about or we can talk about it on field trip. And I love this particular place where the stone steps go or terra sets go right across the stone stripes, not far from you guys. Okay. Going to a larger scale now, uh, these are approximately 100 meters or 100, 200 meters across in Northeast Greenland. 
These are non-sorted polygons. And here near the coast, the ice wedges have melted. So instead of having these ice, uh, these places that have been squeezed by horizontal motion of freezing ice, we have low places over thawed ice wedges. Uh, and then, so in terms of, so that was an example of non-sorting. Here's another example, and these are worldwide. For example, they're, uh, they're widespread on the Columbia Plateau. For example, along the interstate, as you drive from where you guys live up to Spokane, there are these non-sorted circles, which are composed of lust to the Northeast of you. Uh, this is in Mongolia. And my favorite non-sorted, at least at the surface pattern ground is at Mima Prairie. You are probably aware that dozens and dozens of papers have been written on the origin of Mima Prairie. Uh, my dissertation was just to the Northwest and I asked people what caused them and I got answers like ejecta from Mount Rainier, which is visible from here, uh, shark's nest, whale wallows, et cetera. But there actually is an explanation for these. They were made by gophers. Everybody thinks that beavers are nature's engineers, but gophers are too. They made the Mima Mounds. And there's, there's no doubt about the fact that they made them. The only question is, why did they make them? Is it because they worried about nuclear fallout and they were very concerned or were they just having fun on their golf courses? Okay, on to soliflexion. Soliflexion can be defined as the slowest of slow motion of water saturated material, usually with a lot of fines in it, slowly creeping down the hill. And because it, there is a differential rate of motion, some parts of it overrun other parts and that gives us soliflexion lobes. So here's a soliflexion lobe up front. The fact that it is saturated, at least in the summer, is illustrated by the fact that water is pouring out of it. Soliflexion can make some pretty spectacular, I'll call them stone stripes for, for want of a better word, up here on Alaska's Seward Peninsula. Uh, that's supposed to be black up at the top. Then another phenomena which is related to freeze thaw is every process associated with snow banks. That would include freezing and thawing, meltwater running down the hill, creep of the snow bank, the snow bank preventing vegetation from growing under it, which means that that ground is more susceptible to erosion by raindrop impact and everything else. So a student and I wrote, wrote a paper on, on these mostly north facing hollows on the north sides of many of our Palouse Hills in Eastern Washington. And we tried to argue that the only thing that could possibly do it was snow banks. You can ask more about that later if you want. Another phenomena almost always present where there is permafrost is alf ice, which is a, a German word. Uh, it can result from either groundwater uh, rising uh, coming out of springs and freezing in the winter, or it can result at, the, result at the surfaces of rivers where the river just keeps freezing and freezing and the water pops up through the ice on its surface and gets freezing more and more on the surface, alf ice. So now uh, we've seen a bunch of small landforms uh, of patterned ground. Look at some of, let's look at some of the other features associated with permafrost. In many cases, there is an ice wedge. Ice wedges are in polygonal patterns and they grow, I'll try to make this short. They grow by cold temperature contraction, getting a crack in the ground, the active layer melting, the water pouring down into that crack and making an ice wedge that's only a, a centimeter thick. Then the next winter, when the ground freezes again, the weakness in the ground is where that ice, that one centimeter thick ice wedge is. And so it splits in the same place. And the next summer, the meltwater from the thawing active layer goes down again. And now that ice wedge is twice as thick. So the ice wedge you see here has been growing for probably thousands of years. As I said, the ice wedges are in polygonal patterns and if they melt, this is what you get. We're getting these polygons. 
Uh, a, another feature is uh, a PALS, the singular of it, singular of it, of it is PLS and the plural is P-A-L-S-E-N, but there is some variation in that. Uh, in several places where I've take stu taken students to do research in Mongolia, we had Paulson, they're, they're kind of cool. They typically are five to 10 meters in diameter and they're one to two meters above the surface and uh, they grow until eventually the ground over them cracks and then the sun gets in and starts to melt them and you can see them. Sometimes in the ice, the ice inside them is candle ice, which you can see up there. The largest permafrost feature I can think of is a pingo. If you're an igneous petrologist, you know the term lacolith. Pingos have been called water ice lacoliths. Uh, they can be uh, tens of meters high. They can be almost 100 meters high. They can be a kilometer across. They're amazing. They grow and they grow and grow until the uh, top cracks, the sun gets into play, the ice starts melting, and then they collapse. And that's approximately a 1,000 year cycle. Okay. Now, most of you probably know the word karst, which refers to caverns and sinkholes and other underground or surface topography due to the solution of limestone and, and marble and dull stone and sometimes gyprock, et cetera. Here are a couple of spectacular examples of sinkholes. Uh, this one occurred at a tennis complex in South Africa and one tennis player got swollen and was never seen again. This one occurred in Orlando, Florida, which I misspelled in 1991 and swallowed about a dozen brand new Porsches. Okay. So the word thermokarst means a karst type of topography resulting from the thawing of permafrost. It's important to realize that in areas of permafrost, the distribution of ice is not uniform. There will be places where there is dry rock that is below freezing. When it freezes and thaws, it doesn't go up and down. And there'll be ice wedges, which are pure ice, and there'll be a there'll be a trench that develops and there'll be places with just a little bit of ice like this area right here had more ice in it than the areas next to it. So we're just getting a bumpy road, that one in Finland. In many places in Siberia, Canada and Alaska, the permafrost is thawing and there's a lot of positive feedback. Once you get the first small thaw lake, it absorbs a lot of heat energy and leads to increased thawing along the bank. So these thaw lakes get bigger and bigger and bigger. If they're up on the North Slope where there are no trees, then you don't get this kind of a picture. But if they're in the area of discontinuous permafrost, for example, in the uh, Yukon Basin, as this forest underlain by permafrost uh, starts collapsing as the thermofrost frost melts and we get this term a drunken forest. Uh, sometimes these thaw lakes are in a pattern which is uh, somewhat related to ice wedges, but there's they're probably ice wedges on a smaller scale. And this can stretch for hundreds of kilometers on the north slope of Alaska, these thaw lakes. So Here's a simple example along the Alaskan Highway where they removed uh, the surface layer to get at the gravel and they removed some of the gravel uh, enough so that the insulating active layer was, not, was, was no longer there and so the ice wedge thawed and we got a collapse that looks like this or like this. If we have thawing, and if where the thawing is occurring happens to be on a slope, then we not only get thawing, we get tilting or, or we get movement down the slope. This is a hill north of Fairbanks and the heat from what went into the bottom of the outhouse caused heat, which caused the thermofrost down here to melt. And also because it was on a slight slope, the outhouse tilted away. They have to be very, very careful of the Alaska pipeline because more than half its distance is in permafrost terrain. So one of the things they do is they put curves in it to allow for expansion and contraction. 
And then at some places, they actually, the best thing for them to do is to put it underground. Sometimes they put it above creeks and rivers, like at the Yukon River, and sometimes they put it below it. So any ground that happens to be undergoing freeze thaw and also has subsidence, what's ever on top of it, there's a very good chance that it is going to subside and tilt. Uh, this is, the, I think, the first picture that I ever saw of this occurrence. This cabin in Alaska is being hilted, is being heated. Its porch is not being heated. The cabin is, is sinking, and this end of the porch is not. The destruction of buildings underlain by permafrost may not be a giant collapse. It may only be shattering. Of, of masonry and windows. Uh, here's another example of there wasn't much heat at this end of the building and there was a lot of heat down here and differential subsidence. Here's another example. I'm, I'm putting some of these quotes from various news services around the world. 50% uh, of Arctic infrastructure, roads and buildings by 2050. Here's a, a world map. I showed you a map earlier of Alaska. Here's a world map of where there is permafrost with the dark being, conti being continuous, the, the, the lavender being discontinuous, and the light being just sporadic permafrost. I'm probably going to mention this again, but as permafrost melts, the upper layer undergoes aerobic decomposition, which results in carbon dioxide. The lower part decays anaerobically, and so methane is sent up into the skies. The emissions from permafrost represent 5 to 15 percent of global warming. There's some more numbers up here about some of these major cities that are on permafrost and how bad things they are. This is not all brand new. This was known as early as World War II. So I'm, I'm just gonna show some pictures now and I admit that I did not take the next half dozen pictures or so. I just pulled them off the internet this week of subsidence and tilting. And if I can focus for a minute on what's happening in the north coast of Alaska and places in Siberia. We have thawing of the permafrost from above. We have thawing of the permafrost from the side because the uh, ocean is relatively warm. We have waves that are, that are eroding these embankments and causing collapse. And we have icebergs that are being pounded against the shore by the waves. The, the total combination of all that results in a lot of erosion and a lot of collapse. So some of these, these are uh, all Alaskan villages and in some places they've put riprap to try to slow the problem. In some places roads are being undermined. The edge of the sea is creeping toward buildings some of which are falling over the bank. The same is true of rivers. Uh, this is in northernmost Mongolia, near Russia. And this river called the Tengaskal is thawing the permafrost here. And so the ground is collapsing into the river. The same thing is happening here in Alaska. So now I'm going to go to the third part of my presentation. Um, another now I'm ten minutes behind or whatever. About global climate change, and to those deniers, I have this question, which you can read here at the bottom. If it isn't greenhouse gases that are warming our atmosphere, what is? Okay, once again, it doesn't want to move. 
uh, there it is. Okay. I have sent this to Liz. I spent most of 40 hours putting it together from dozens and dozens of sources. I'm going to show one slide for each of these items in terms of how it relates to uh, global warming. And Liz has generously volunteered to send you this slide if you ask for it. So uh, I know, we know that if you just look at the temperature of the earth in let's say the year 1800, its temperature was 60% dependent on the amount of water vapor in our atmosphere. And there were some other things like volcanoes erupting that did one thing or another, or emissions of methane from where permafrost was melting or carbon dioxide from humans or whatever, but 60% of our temperature was due to greenhouse gases. As we warm the earth, that increases evaporation, which puts more vapor in our atmosphere, which makes the temperature go up even farther. This is one example of positive feedback. The two ways in which water vapor influence temperature is because, or rather where water, uh, liquid and solid, is the clouds reflect sunlight and uh, our atmosphere allows incoming short wave radiation but traps a lot of the outgoing long wave radiation. So I really need, I think I'm going to uh, skip these in the interest of time because you'd like probably like me to finish somewhere uh, in, a, in an hour, but these are just some uh, factors of carbon dioxide, uh, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, uh, ozone, sulfur dioxide, uh, a whole bunch of chemicals that are all man-made, um, fluorinated gases, which have replaced a lot of the CFCs and HCFCs, uh, volatile organic compounds, some are natural, like from conifers, but a lot of them are from humans. Uh, black carbon is something that people, it's not a gas, but people have not paid very much attention to it. It is currently the second largest driver of climate warming. Look at this coal fired power plant. Look at this darkness on this sea ice, which is increasing the rate it melts. Look at this ship. Most of the ship's world are using bunker fuel to get across the oceans. They put out a tremendous amount of black carbon that is increasing the melting rate of sea ice and glaciers. I was really surprised to learn that So now I'm gonna show you about five pictures of the Earth's temperature change. Here we'll go for the last 500 million years. And we can see that we've had some cold periods, each of which was an ice age. And then we're gonna, but notice that it's very erratic. All of these curves are gonna be very erratic. Here we go just for the last, for the Cenozoic and we can see that uh, Antarctica moved close enough to the South Pole and the Earth's temperature was cooling enough so that Antarctica got to be glaciated about here. Greenland, got, Greenland started being glaciated roughly 6 million years or so ago. And then here we start to have Scandinavia and uh, Canada glaciated. Now, if we go to only 5 million years ago, notice the seesaw due to the Milankovitch things. And then if we go just to the last 450,000 years, we saw this graph before, and we can see these changes in ice volume and temperature based on uh, foraminifera and oxygen isotopes from sediment cores. And this is a really important graph. This is the take home message tonight, if you didn't already know it. So here's the last 11,000 years. 
here's the end of the last glaciation, which we can define in many ways, but one way would be in which ice retreats to the US-Canada border. This period, particularly the middle of it, is called the altithermal or the hypsithermal or the period of maximum warmth and dryness. I cannot emphasize too strongly that if humans had not interfered, we would be going back into another ice age. Interglaciations are short, typically 10,000 years. Glaciations are long, typically 100,000 years. So here we are starting to cool down by what's called neoglaciation. And then we had the medieval warm period when the Vikings went to Greenland. Uh, but then we got into the little ice age and what's hard to see in this graph is what's happened in the last 200 years. That's this curve right here. So now uh, I'm going to argue that for the last 10,000 years and particularly in the last 2,000 years that it is humans who have controlled climate. I recommend very strongly an old book by Bill Ruddeman, uh, a colleague of mine called Plows, Plagues and Petroleum. I'll try to summarize what he said. The agricultural revolution starting about 10,000 years ago increased the warming that was occurring naturally from the Milankovitch cycle. Forests were cut, prairies were plowed, pigs and cattle were domesticated and started putting out lots of methane. We started having rice, rice paddies, which put out lots of meth methane. And then there was a diminution of warming due to a combination of factors, probably due to loss of human life, less agriculture and more forest, that brought on the little ice age. And then we had the industrial revolution with fossil fuels, which is the number one thing causing what's going on today. So I'm gonna make a list for you of things that I believe have been very important in, in human contributions to global warming. You could say, what, you're kidding me. The near extinction, extinction of beavers caused global warming. Think of the amount of organics that were stored in beaver ponds with a sediment before we got rid of most of the beavers and the rivers ripped out the beaver ponds and that sediment was no longer in the soil. It went to the sea and it oxidized into carbon dioxide. This one you've probably never heard of before, but think of the biomass of 2.9 million whales and think about what happens when we burn whale oil and they're no longer in the sea. The largest carbon reservoir on earth is in the oceans. And a lot of it is microscopic stuff like foraminifera and coccolis, but a lot of it is in sharks and fish and things like that. So our overfishing is actually contributed to global warming. Mining and local deforestation using, using timbers for in the mines, using timbers for smelting, using timbers to, to, to make mine shafts, uh, and logging railroads, I mean, and mining railroads and buildings and things like that. Logging, double whammy, get rid of the trees that are long, no longer a climate sink. Burn them and things are even worse, a carbon sink. Catastrophic forest fires. They make things warmer just by their burning. They, they put out lots of carbon dioxide and those trees are no longer sequestering carbon. Overgrazing by cattle and sheep, re causing soil erosion, the soil that had lots of organic sequestered in it, getting rid of vegetation, which pulls CO2 out of the air. This is a cemetery north of Walla Walla. The oldest graves here are from 1850. We don't till cemeteries. This is how much plowing has gone here since 1850. The or this see how dark this is. It had a lot of organics in it. Those organics are now gone. It ends up to three quarters of a ton of soil per bushel of wheat for a century. Wetlands. Notice this: wetlands store or stored past tense twice as much carbon as all of the Earth's forests. Fifty-four percent of Earth's wetlands have been destroyed in the last century. Now, as they oxidize and uh, 
decay anaerobically, they are emitting greenhouse gases. Overpopulation, enough said. And widespread use of fossil fuels, the number one culprit. And I have three questions for you. Is the only problem with coal the fact that it causes acid rain and global warming? Is the only problem with oil that it causes global warming and wars? Is the only problem with natural gas global warming? I could talk for a half an hour about positive feedback. I'll give you one example that you probably are already aware of. As snow melts and rock is exposed, as sea ice melts and ocean is exposed, the albedo is reduced, the reflectivity is reduced, and more sunlight is soaked up. I threw this little thing in that I learned from the paper today that's not exactly related to positive feedback. But the Amazon rainforest may stop being a forest, and it's, a, it's sequestration of carbon dioxide is going to plummet. So to wrap up, is the only problem with global climate change warming. You're all aware of storms, forest fires, floods, drought. And I, I just cannot help but mention really quickly, sort of indirectly related to sea level rise. Today, the most sea level rise is occurring due to the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, more so than from all the world's mountain glaciers. Again, to point out that when sea ice melts, it doesn't change sea level. We're never going to have 260 feet of sea level rise. There's always going to be some Antarctica there. Uh, so what are we doing? This is, this is the one that irks me the most right here. Europe with more than 5,400 offshore wind turbines and the United States with seven. I'm sure that global warming is happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. I really, I really enjoyed that. I know I definitely, one of the big things that I had never thought about before was some of the contaminants on top of the glaciers uh, causing them to melt quicker. I hadn't thought about that, but you know, as soon as you mentioned it, you're like, well, yeah, of course it would. So I'm glad that I, I would not have thought about it in that way, but it makes sense as soon as, as soon as you said that. Yes, thanks, Bob. I really appreciated this uh, this presentation. Uh, I learned a bunch. Hey, Big well, Brother Dick. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you as uh, as always a very good uh, entertaining lecture and uh, well done um, one question you know I guess philosophical or whatever um, uh, is the is the cow out of the barn I mean what do we do now <laughs> you know what's what, you know, are we going to spend more, you know, tax money and try to try to understand this, or do we uh, adapt and and move, or you know, what what are your thoughts? Yesterday, while bicycling around town, I did what I often do. I uh, went up to a car where the motor was running, and somebody was talking on his cell phone. It was 60 degrees in Walla Walla. It was really nice. He said he had his motor running for his air conditioning. His windows were closed. I got out his camera and took a picture of me and threatened to call the police. <laughs> so we all, we all do what we can do. Uh, with some hesitation, I want to compare global climate change with uh, the Ukraine. We knew what was going to happen, and we didn't do very much to prevent it. The, the situation in the Ukraine is so dire that a lot is now being done. I think the single biggest reason that we haven't done much about global climate change is because it's not fast enough. 
it just isn't shocking us enough. You would think that the, the heat and drought last summer, the widespread forest fires, her, the worst hurricanes and the worst tornadoes ever in the United States, I think, uh, the, the terrible flooding in Europe, you would think that if that wasn't going to do it, it would wake us up, but it didn't. Pretty gloomy, Bob. <laughs> I have another happier topic. <clears throat> Go ahead. for it. Um, <clears throat> you had a slide back there on a, a glacier, a, a, a glacier field without a glacier from Costa Rica. Yes, sir. Uh, I did not follow your discussion as how you know there's a glacier there and it's never snowed there. Oh, okay. So there was a glacier there in the Pleistocene based on lots of evidence, moraines, Paternoster lakes, glacial troughs, uh, striations. Uh, okay. Then, it, and that then, glacier probably disappeared uh, 10 to 15,000 years ago, those glaciers on Chiripo. Okay. I thought I heard you say it had never snowed there and I couldn't see it, but it hasn't snowed in recent centuries. Yes, exactly. I figured it had to snow sometime, otherwise you couldn't get a glacier. <laughs> Maybe we had methane, frozen methane glacier. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you had some wonderful pictures there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm glad to share them with you. Oh, uh, let's. Uh... Let's look forward to the uh, field trip that Bob's going to lead. Yeah. And uh, that's only a few weeks away. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's get people signed up. Uh, Liz, can you help me get that list? Uh, an avail you know, uh, what do you call it? a sign up list mm -hmm. available for people? And uh, let's get her done. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> um, I'd be happy to help with that, get that coordinated. I'm sure there will be some communications coming out here pretty shortly too about it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't need to say this publicly, but I will. Uh, I'm really strapped with time right now because our mammoth dig is opening. Uh, by the way, if you want to take a tour of the mammoth dig, uh, too late till June, but... <laughs> We're, uh, we're uh, going to restart uh, signups on June 1st, but uh, 